What's the vibe, y'all? Welcome to Running Off the Screen, presented by Raptors Republic. I am the man they call Mac. Now, please leave a like, comment, subscribe. I will be here on a weekly basis providing some insight and analysis focused on the Toronto Raptors. Now, I'm just another Raptors fan, you know, someone who's passionate about the team's success, and I enjoy interacting with like-minded individuals, and hopefully we can build this community and have some great conversations. Now, this episode, I will look into the Toronto Raptors free agency, um, the Kyle Lowry trade, and just have a quick breakdown of our summer league roster. As Raptors fans, year after year, we have this expectation that we're going to come away from free agency with, you know, checking off players on our collective wish list. For instance, uh, Rashawn Holmes and Nerlens Noel. We have to save ourselves from the heartache. And just remember, there are three different ways to assemble a team. There's free agency. There's the draft and there's trade market, right? And unfortunately, if you are not a big market team, you are at a severe disadvantage in the free agent market, at least when it comes to the top free agents. For whatever reason, being maybe being in a different country, uh, the taxes, the winter weather, the Toronto Raptors are in the crop of teams dealing with this issue. All this despite being ranked in NBA market size in the sixth spot, according to Hoop Social. Toronto was placed behind uh, the the New York teams, Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Dallas. With that said, during the Maasai era, I think our biggest free agent splash may have been in 2015 when we signed Damari Carroll to four years, $58 million. And then two years later, we traded him for Justin Hamilton. So yeah, you we know how that went, right? And the chain of underwhelming free agent moments just continues year after year. And this season's version, we ended up signing Sam Decker and Ishmael Wainwright who both look like partial guarantees and training camp deals. But we need to accept something for the time being. You know, just picture the NBA free agency as a luxurious dinner party with 30 people, you know, and let's say the, let's, we're saying 30 because there's 30 teams. And now picture there's only six plates available. The New York teams get get something. The Los Angeles teams get a plate. And the rest of the teams or people are left to fight for or share the remaining ones. That's just how it feels to me. So a team like the Raptors choose to leave the dinner party and go elsewhere. You know, put together their own recipe. You know, find their own ingredients and put together something that they can make them survive another day, another month, or even years, depending on how it uh, pans out. Now, this is why we usually go off the radar or we go overseas. That's why it's so common with our squad. You know, this season, it, we just went there again and we ended up picking up Sam Decker, like I said, and Ishmael Wainwright. Now, with Sam Decker as a person, he comes with some controversy, you know, so hopefully our front office did some further re- research on the matter, and I can imagine they have. But as for Sam Decker, the basketball player, he's part of the six foot nine player offseason theme. Uh, he's a decent all around player, uh, but I think the Raptors expect him to come in as a three point shooter. Know, could see him possibly competing with Yuta for that swing forward spot because Nick Nurse did mention uh, in a press conference sometime in May that he wanted Yuta to, to become a better or even a scary 
three-point shooter. So adding that type of uh, competition makes sense. Last season in the Turkish Super League, Sam Decker shot 45% from three. The same category he struggled with having consistency with in the NBA in his previous stint, where he shot 29%. Now, two seasons ago, he shot 30% in the Euro Cup. So that 45% might be a fluke or maybe he figured out the mechanics. And either way, that's why the Raptors felt he earned a closer look. Ishmael Wainwright, surprisingly, is not 6'9". Uh, he, he gives me um, PJ Tucker vibes. You know, being a 6'5 player who weighs around 240 pounds. Uh, he also has a 7'1 wingspan. So I guess that allows him to play bigger than his actual height. Now this past season, he played in a league in France where he averaged 12 points, 5 rebounds, and 1.8 steals. You may have to look past the numbers with a guy like him. Um, Wayne Wright was brought in for his toughness and his potential on the defensive end. And again, like, there are three different ways to assemble a team. And luckily for us, we have been blessed with a front office competent enough to navigate through trades and the draft at, at an, an impressive success rate. And speaking of trades, we have the departure of Kyle Lowry. The complete return is reported as Goran Dragic and Precious Achua. Now, I wish we could have had some sort of draft compensation, but I guess it will come once or I guess if we flip Dragic. If he were to stay, you know, it'd be he would be a pretty valuable piece, especially for the development of Malachi Flynn and just another veteran point guard to learn from. A point guard who played under Steve Nash, you know, has a lot of success in the playoffs and even international play so he's very savvy very crafty i wouldn't mind having him off the bench this season it's just awkward that he heard his name being dangled and now he has to play with the team that was trying to trade him you know it's, but again that's a part of the business right and with achua i really liked achua in the draft process and i always thought he could have been a bam out of bio type of defender even before he got to miami my introduction to Precious was during the 2019 uh, McDonald's High School Dunk Contest where he showed some fluid athleticism and explosive ability to finish Showtime dunks with either hand. You know, and as an athlete, you know, he is a step up from Kem Burge and Freddie Gillespie, but most bigs um, need some time to develop their offensive game and he's on that list. During the Olympics, he did showcase an improved jump shot, uh, looking very comfortable taking and making threes. And he also displayed his ability to bring up the ball up the court, off the rebound. So uh, the defensive potential of our team is off the charts. I'm slowly starting to understand Masai and his staff's master plan. Get as many players who are six in that six foot nine range who have different skill sets on offense, but can switch three to four different positions on defense. You know, it's the dawn of the positionless lineup. You know, that man, that could be like a title of the Toronto Raptors documentary if this experiment is successful. But too bad we couldn't get to see Achua suit up for our summer league squad, but our roster looks like the following. We have Malachi Flynn. I think we're in for a big season from Flynn. Uh, we He has been lighting it up in the pro-am circuit and he looks to have added some weight to his frame. We have Delano Banton, Rexdale kid. If he can go out there and show some improvement with his three-point shot, he could be one of the biggest steals of the draft. You know, his height, and playmaking ability are things you can't teach. So adding a refined go-to skill will make him a scary prospect. Ashton Haggins, 22-year-old defensive-minded point guard, played for a well-established college program in Kentucky a couple um, years ago 
He averaged 1.5 steals and almost two steals in his two seasons there. Draft comparisons likened him to Pat Beverly, but like Pat Beverly, there's not much coming from him on the offensive end. So let's see how much he developed that side of his game. He had a two-way contract with the Timberwolves um, before, but he was waived in February due to violating COVID protocols. We have Matt Morgan, not the former WWE wrestler, but the Raptors 905er, the Cornell product who always had a knack for scoring. David Johnson, the rookie third wheel. Glad he finally got a chance uh, to get some camera time just to show the fans he actually exists. He has a ton of upside as a combo guard. I compared him to Spencer Dimweedy before, and I'll stand by that comparison. With being six foot five and having a 6'10 wingspan, the ability to break down a defense and catch and shoot ability, I have warmed up to the fact that our team selected three guards in the draft. Jalen Adams, 25 year old scoring guard. This past season with the Erie Bayhawks, he averaged 48% from the field, 40% from three, and 90% from the line. We have Yuta Watanabe. Like I said before, he just needs to show the ability and willingness to shoot the ball uh, and shoot the three ball if he wants to continue to have a role on this team. He doesn't have many holes in his game. It just comes down to him playing with some aggression and assertiveness. But he does that on defense, so I guess just play with that same aggression and assertiveness on offense. We have Justin Champagny, 20 year old, six foot seven small forward, resembles Norman Powell a bit, no? Or, or is it just me? Like, I don't know, like a cousin or a brother? Uh, but anyway, the Champagny Poppy was the only major conference player in Division I to average a double double, averaging 18 points and 11 rebounds. He was also one of three players in the past 25 years that had consecutive games with at least 20 points and 20 rebounds. The other two to do it were Blake Griffin and Caleb Swanigan. He also finished tied second in the ACC for player of the year behind Moses Wright, who was supposed to be on our summer league roster, but backed out for whatever reason. Uh, Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus Darko Kelly. A 24-year-old, 6'6 wing, had a productive career at Providence, averaged 18 points, 9 boards, 5 assists, 1.5 steals, and a block, while also shooting 90% from the line. We have Isaiah Mike, 23-year-old, 6'8 wing. He's from Toronto, and his father, fun fact, was part of the Baby Blue Sound Crew, a known DJ crew in the city back in the day. He is a good shooter off the catch, best at scoring with off-ball movement. Uh, he is just a solid all-around player. He's pretty similar to O'Shea Brissett. We see Scotty Barnes. Again, he's a top five talent. Toronto's adopted son. I expect him to fill up the box score this summer league. The same question with a lot of the prospects on this team is will he be able to shoot the three at a decent clip defensively we don't have to worry about him and his ability to communicate and be active vocally on the floor will be the glue this team will feed off of especially if they have to grind out a couple close games ishmael wainwright 26 year old 65 forward i mentioned him earlier toughness and versatility on the defensive end will earn him an opportunity moving forward he just needs to study a ton of PJ Tucker tape. Rayshon Hammonds, 22-year-old, 6'8 forward. Versatile, can play both forward spots and is a decent scorer. He just needs to be more aggressive on the floor, but not reckless. Freddie Gillespie, we would like to see him polish up some of his offensive tools. A lot of the Raptors fans are praying that Gillespie can be a solid center on the final roster just to release the anxiety of us not 
making a big move at that spot this offseason. Anis Mahmoud, uh, the only seven footer on the roster. The 26 year old apparently has a 7'6 wingspan. Comes with some solid movement for his size and can be become a great shot blocker. It just all comes down to his defensive IQ and just being able to avoid silly fouls. This first summer league game, I could imagine the starting lineup being maybe Flynn, Morgan, Utah, Barnes, and Gillespie. I predict that Barnes will finish the game with 17.7 rebounds, five assists, two steals, and two blocks. Yuta Watanabe will be the leading scorer, and Flynn will probably have three three-pointers made. Let me know what you think of our Summer League roster and the just the Raptors offseason so far. Also, be sure to come back here and speak on my predictions after the game. And please remember to like, subscribe, and raise the vibe. Peace.